Well, hello and welcome to the third session of the conference, The Hidden Hero, How Can a Net Zero Food System Be Delivered for the Benefit of People and Planet? This session is called, Where Do Farmers and Growers Need to Act to Deliver a Net Zero Food System? My name is Marcus Gover, I'm Chief Executive of RAP and I'll be your moderator today. We have four speakers, Sophie Throop from Morrison's, Adele Jones from the Sustainable Food Trust, Nina Pritchard from McDonald's and Ken Giller from Wageningen University. Now, first of all, I want to invite Sophie Throop from Morrison's to, to address us. Now, Sophie is Head of Agriculture, Fisheries and Sustainable Sourcing at Morrison's. She has a farming background and has been on the Red Tractor Poultry Board and is now Main Board Non-Executive Director for Associated Food Standards, Red Tractor. She's part of the steering committee for the IGD Food Industry Initiative for Antimicrobials, and she helped to set up the Centre of Innovation Excellence in Livestock, for whom she is still a non-executive director. So Sophie, my first question to you in this session on, on growing and farming. What does Morrison see as the key priorities for action to deliver a net zero future? And what's currently being planned by Morrison's with its UK and international supply chain? So Sophie. Well, thank you very much indeed, Marcus, and thank you for the invitation today. Um, I'm looking forward to the, to the debate in the session. So, so just to give a, a little bit of a background, and thank you very much indeed for introducing me. So as Morrisons, um, for those of you who are maybe not as familiar, we're a UK-based supermarket. And we have nearly 500 uh, stores across the um, mainland UK. Um, but most unusually as well, we're also a manufacturing business. So uh, hugely interesting. We have 20 manufacturing sites around the country, um, taking in everything from fish and, uh, and eggs. Uh, we've got three free three fish processing facilities and one egg, egg packing plant, but also to abattoirs, three abattoirs and meat processing factories as well. So, you know, this sort of integrated nature um, is a really, makes us a really interesting business. And for me, one of the main reasons I wanted to sort of join Morrison's actually um, from, uh, from previous careers working with them in, within the veterinary industry. Um, and so as Morrison's, you know, as you can imagine, as a retailer, we do huge amounts of listening with our customers. Uh, we know that animal welfare um, continues to be a really, really important um, area for us to sort of continue to sort of think about in our agricultural strategy. But also that supporting British farmers is something our customers regularly vote with their feet on um, and, uh, and uh, really, really sort of um, encourage us to support. They, they sort of place it as number two in their priorities list really um, and have done in a very big survey we do for a number of years now. But increasingly, and you know, together with the rest of society, customers and citizens um, were asking more and more questions about the environment and about the role of, um, you know, how we can sort of help look after our uh, biodiversity, climate, um, and environment. And really, um, as a retailer, you know, customers often look to us to help do their worrying for them, really. Um, it's part of our role to ensure that the food that we're sourcing from and the farmers that are working with, um, and working with directly in our case, as we're buying directly into manufacturing, are really thinking about and starting to address some of those future challenges. So on the back of all of that and thinking really, really carefully about, uh, about the climate crisis that we're sort of uh, within and, uh, and what the right role was to play, uh, we, uh, we thought long and hard about how we approached this. And after doing some trial work um, earlier this year, set up a, a, a sort of strategy to be um, net zero within our UK agricultural supply chain as a collective whole uh, by 2030, which is hugely ambitious, uh, we recognise. Um, we set that very, very challenging date for a reason. You know, it, it, it's important to do something now um, to sort of act on things that are within your watch and to really encourage um, the innovation and the development and um, the initiatives and creativity that are really required to help get behind some of the really huge problems that we're all facing. Uh, I know that obviously we're sort of here talking about food as the hidden hero, but for us, you know, farmers are certainly the hidden heroes and the hidden sort of um, potentially solution for many of the things that were within the climate issues that we face. And so, and so for us to be able to work, set a strategy, but then importantly, um, work very closely with industry experts um, from, you know, sort of vets to academics and uh, to nutritionists to land um, experts on supporting our farmers to help make that journey towards net zero is, is hugely, hugely important. 
Um, and obviously, you know, we are sourcing from, yes, the UK and this and this um, particular net zero ask is specifically for our UK farmers. But, you know, we are um, also a source from international supply chains. So we are also thinking long and hard and carefully about how we how we work within our wider um, supply chains, too. And what are the right sort of um, signals and what are the right mechanics and standards to put into place? And that and that's going to come in the next, you know, in the coming years. But at the moment, our focus, because primarily we're 100 percent british in all of our fresh meat our fresh milk um are the eggs we sell you know we have this big manufacturing business we have got very much of a uk focus in how we can try and help um our farmers uh, start off on that really important path um to get them to uh, to a net zero position so that sort of hopefully gives you a little bit of, a, of an overview and a breakdown about what we are doing as Morrisons, who what Morrisons are as a business and how we're starting to approach this, um, this big uh, sort of area that we're all looking at today. Um, I think the, probably the summary of it all though is that it certainly isn't easy and we certainly wouldn't claim to have all of the solutions at all. So, so much of what we're doing too is about how can we work in partnership uh, with others and how can we sort of work within industry to share best practice and to understand you know how we can go further but how we can listen to where others are, are doing really really well and sort of bring that within our approach too and those others that are doing well certainly include the farmers that we're sourcing from you know we have some fantastically innovative creative um and uh, and you know hugely um forward-looking farmers who have been thinking about this for a while and in many cases we're doing some really great things that perhaps needed a bit more profile a bit more structure a bit more sort of um uh, you know um airtime to help get that sort of set of practices um cascaded along a wider a wider supply base so uh, so yeah a really um hopefully interesting sort of strategy to take us for, uh, forward for net zero but uh, but yeah certainly it's a big it's a big problem and a big area an opportunity um, perhaps for farmers um, to address um, over these coming years. So I think, uh, yeah, that probably sort of like nicely sums up uh, where we are overall as Morrisons, um, but uh, I'd be really happy obviously as we go on through uh, the rest of the um, talk to answer any more sort of questions that are starting to come through. Thank you very much, Sophie. Now, as you're hearing, each of our speakers is really outlining the priorities they see for farmers and growers. And as Sophie has just said, they probably are the hidden heroes of the food system. But just to give you a bit of context to that, you know, RAP and UNEP research suggests that fast progress on agricultural productivity, improved sand, land and soil management are going to be needed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I'm sure we're going to hear that more. But also achieving zero deforestation, particularly on tropical forest commodities like palm and soy, might have a big impact. And I think we're going to hear more about that. Now you'll get a chance to ask your questions, so put them into the Q&A slot as the speakers are speaking, and then we'll come back to those at the end. Um, we'll also record the session if you want to watch it again later as well. Now our next speaker is Adele Jones from the Sustainable Food Trust. Now Adele is the Deputy Chief Executive of the Sustainable Food Trust. She's been with the Trust since 2013 and now oversees the organisation's strategic activities. Now in recent years, one of her major successes has been the development of a project called the Global Farm Metric, and that's an international framework for measuring on-farm sustainability. And she's also an advisor to the Scottish Government. So Adele, um, what are the key priorities for farmers and growers in the UK and internationally to deliver a net zero future? And what is the Sustainable Food Trust doing to achieve these ends? So over to you. Thank you, Marcus, and to the whole RAP team for putting putting on this conference. I think it's, it's such an important issue and feels all the more pertinent given conversations going on at the moment, not least about things like labour shortages in, in supply chains, um, but also the fact that the Climate Change Summit is coming up and at least to our minds, food and farming, which is, is as, as this conference title suggests, is one of the hidden heroes, could be one of the biggest solutions to climate change. Uh, despite that, it's somewhat missing in action from the, the top of the COP agenda, um, at least in a, in a formal sense. So we're trying to rectify that by doing lots of things on the sidelines to showcase what could work. Um, but it was a really great question that was posed to me about what, what what's the priority for farmers and growers in, in the run up to net, becoming net zero. Um, and I first of all wanted to sort of preface that question by saying that if farmers and growers are ever going to reach that point, we have to make farming in that way which serves you know 
climate change mitigation uh, addresses the nature crisis and also things like public health and well-being of communities we have to make that method of production or those methods of production the most um no-brainer business case we have to we have to make it profitable for those those farmers on the ground to be able to help them shift in that way and why is it not profitable at the moment i was really he uh, pleased to hear mention of some of the discussions that have been going on earlier in the day about the hidden cost of food and true cost accounting and just wanted to draw attention to a prop which I bought which is um, probably going to be flipped around the wrong way on this video but it's a, a report called the hidden cost of UK food which we published in 2017 which still feels just as relevant today and the conclusion of the report is that for every one pound consumers spend in the marketplace there's another hidden pound at the very least another hidden pound um, spent in ways that they don't realize to effectively clean up the costs of uh, you know the, the type of production systems that we have predominantly at the moment so that might be um you know when you pay your water company uh, each month um through your household bills actually a lot of that money is going towards treating that water for um fertilizers pesticides that have run off into those water courses and of course public health is another example of the way that we're paying for things in hidden ways and i think we really need to address that that balance of economic advantage and shift it uh, towards um, those methods of production which can be part of the climate change solution and to be able to do that we obviously need government policies which help farmers make those transitions we obviously need um, the the markets to to be able to, to provide those signposts to farmers that there is an alternative vision now and they can help them make those changes um, there's also other levers like the financial community um, whether it's bank managers of farmers or the or investments, um, there's a lot of talk about natural capital and carbon offsetting, which, you know, the, there's a lot to unpick there about whether or not that's a that's a positive or negative thing. But I think um, it could potentially be a really interesting way of shifting, shifting the balance of financial advantage towards these more regenerative methods of production. So there's all sorts of things we can start to introduce to help that shift to take place. But if that's going to happen, we have to start measuring a where we're starting from so called baseline data and b the progress we need to make over time to be able to reach our goals of being net zero or uh, nature friendly and uh, more positive for public health and such like. And um, this this leads me to my the answer to my question about what's what are the priorities for farmers and I would say measuring the things you're doing because you're going to have to start evidencing that you're delivering positive benefits across your whole farming system if you're going to start accessing these new payment streams. So whether it's government market or for you know, private sector investment, you're going to have to start showing what you're delivering on farm, hopefully positive, and where you know, the journey you want to go on to, to be better. And I think um, there's a whole host of organizations that are working now um, to try and create a common set of metrics for measuring whole farm sustainability. Um, it's a project we're leading on called the Global Farm Metric. I'm really pleased that Morrison's and uh, McDonald's also on this panel are involved in those conversations, which is fantastic and more than just involved in, in, in Morrison's case, helping us with trials and that sort of thing. But we're working to create a set of metrics which all farmers could use to measure that that starting point and the change over time and so if i had if i had one message to farmers and growers it would be start measuring things you you know it's going to be data is going to become such an important part of of farming it shouldn't be burdensome for you it should be something that we make really easy and that's what we're you know trying to do with this global farm metric project um but the 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 sooner you can start measuring things and start to get an understanding of the impact you're having positive or negative because we, we need to know everything that's happening on the farm um, then the hopefully easier it will be for you to access those new funding streams which will hopefully enable you to make that transition to being more climate friendly and towards net zero in the future so that that would be my message and i'm sure we can unpick that further in the discussion which really looking forward to so thank you very much Thank you very much, Adele. Um, really, really fascinating. And um, start measuring, as you said, that really is um, a strong message. It's a message that's applied in other parts of the food system. So seeing that coming through to the farmers and growers, I'm sure is going to be, be very important. Our next 
speaker is Nina Pritchard from McDonald's. Now, Nina is head of sustainable and ethical sourcing for McDonald's UK and Ireland. She has over 10 years experience with McDonald's within supply chain development and currently leads the sustainability, agriculture and ethical sourcing function. Her role involves overseeing sustainability throughout the business with a focus on agriculture, environment, climate and sustainable sourcing of food and packaging. Nina previously worked for the Welsh Government and has been the professional advisor for Harper Adams Agriculture University. She's a fellow of the Ford Institute and a member of the RSA. So Nina, my question to you is, what are the key priorities for McDonald's to deliver a net zero future? What is the plan, you know, what's planned as well for the UK and internationally, given the scale of the operations too? So over to you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Marcus. And thank you for the opportunity to um, be on this session today. Um, very important and subject matter. So within McDonald's UK and Ireland, you know, sustainability is and always has been um, very key to our business. Um, over the last couple of decades, we've made some, um, you know, sustainability moves, which have been positive all the way from farm right through to front of counter. If we think about um, the plastics we've reduced, um, the amount of 100% renewable electricity that we've purchased for our restaurants, and also some of those sustainable and ethical moves um, at a farm level, um, from you know, British uh, high welfare pork through to free range eggs that we've had on our menu for over uh, two decades, and, and also the British and Irish um, beef that, that we source um, for our menu. But we really felt that you know, we had to pull all of this together. We had to have much more of an interconnected, um, holistic approach as to how we progress uh, within the sustainability agenda. So um, this week, I'm very proud to have launched our sustainability uh, and business strategy called Plan for Change. And this really sets out our ambitious um, direction of travel, particularly around our aim to achieve um, net zero emissions by 2040 across our entire business and value chain. And this is really important that we are able to um, you know, vocalize our ambition and actually really understand how we can work in collaboration with our entire supply chain. So our suppliers who we've been uh, working with in partnership for a very long time, but also the farmers and growers. And I think, you know, both Sophie and Adele mentioned about the sort of hidden heroes, and that's absolutely right, because without um, the farmers, the growers who we class as our essential ingredient, we don't have that quality produce uh, to serve uh, nearly 4 million customers a day in the UK. So Plan for Change is all about um, bringing uh, this interconnected approach across people, across planet, across our restaurants, and also about how we sustainably um, source food. And if I can just give sort of a couple of examples of how we've already started this process. Um, we only use British potatoes for our um, fries in the UK. Um, and we launched uh, an investment fund um, with our potato supplier, um, investing a million pounds in grants, in technology and in research for British um, potato producers. And this is all about how we look at soil health, how we look at uh, water optimization but also understanding technology and innovation and the role that we can play to support farmers to both share best practice, but also to really understand and measure some of the positive impacts that we can make at a farm level. And completely agree with you know, Adele and Sophie in terms of the importance of both measuring, but also understanding that baseline data so we can really track progress uh, and also understand our milestone targets. We also um, have a big focus within our plan for change on regenerative agriculture. And we work with FAI farms, um, independent researchers um, just outside Oxford on how we can really understand the model of regenerative agriculture. So really looking at a long-term research project around um, soil health, around lower inputs, um, around the economic model, because obviously we want farm businesses to be thriving, sustainable and profitable in the future but also looking at animal welfare and farmer resiliency. And it's really this interconnected approach to sustainability, which is going to be so important as we all embark on the next transition phase across agriculture to, to meet our net zero um, targets and ambitions, but also to understand the positive impact that we can have in restoring biodiversity and restoring nature, which obviously is so important in terms of sustainable um, food systems in, in the future. 
And another role that we can certainly play um, with our scale at McDonald's, um, both locally, if we think of UK and Ireland, and also um, globally as one of the, the biggest brands in the world is around how we share this research, how we share best practice and how we learn from each other across the world. But certainly in, in the UK and Ireland, um, we're heavily involved with the uh, European Roundtable for Beef Sustainability. We obviously work very closely with the likes of, of RAP and um, you know, the Court Oil Commitment uh, and British Retail Consortium. And I think this is absolutely vital. We know that some of the future challenges around climate, around nature biodiversity, um, are, are applicable to everyone. And also it's how we work together to understand what solutions um, we can have in, in place so then we can move together. So it's not a, a one brand um, operation, it's absolutely around collaboration. And the more we can work together, the, the faster we can accelerate um, progress to ensure that we can, we can reach such important um, targets and ambitions such as net zero. Um, but we are also starting with our, our restaurants as well. So it's not just at, at farm level, albeit the, the farmer element of our supply chain is so critical um, to how we progress with our plan for change. We're also looking at our, our restaurants and making them more sustainable and working on uh, a net zero restaurant uh, in Shropshire, which uh, is really exciting for us in terms of creating that blueprint as to how we can then um, roll out um, you know, across our estate in the future. So lots of activity already going on, but as I said, we have a really clear direction of travel. And I think, you know, collaboration is for me the absolute key uh, because we want to move at pace. Uh, we recognize that action needs to be taken now um, and it's essential that we all move in the same direction um, to achieve that. So look forward to more discussion uh, later on around uh, some of that detail. Thank you very much, Nina. And um, I, I think that those words about the power of collaboration are so important. Now, some of these challenges are so big that no one business, no one organisation, not even any one government, I think, can, can solve them. It can only be done by, by working together and through collaboration. That's at the heart of us at RAP and heart of our philosophy about how we, we see change is bringing everyone together to, to support change. So thank you very much for that. Next speaker is Ken Giller from Wageningen University. Now, Ken is Professor of Plant Production Systems at the University. His research focuses on smallholder, smallholder farming systems in sub-Saharan Africa. He's also co-chair of the Thematic Network 7 on Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. He's an honorary fellow of the UNEP World Conservation Monitoring Centre in Cambridge, and he's a member of the Unilever Sustainable Sourcing Advisory Board. Uh, and Ken, my question for you is, what are the key priorities for farmers and growers to deliver net zero across the world? And how is Wagon, Wageningen University working with farmers to encourage change, particularly in the global south? So over to you, Ken. Well, thanks very much indeed. And I must say uh, it's a real privilege to be uh, part of this event today. I've been listening with great interest to the sessions going before, and I think in many ways, what I want to say follows particularly on from what uh, Gita Sethi was saying from the World Bank uh, uh, earlier this afternoon, or maybe it was morning for you. Um, as you'll hear from my accent, although I work in the Netherlands, I, uh, I hail from the UK. Um, yeah, I'd like to say some thoughts about particularly the role of, of small scale farming and, and how all of these things really that we're discussing really impinge on that. And it links very much to this idea of a broader ecological footprint of our consumption and that broader ecological footprint in relation then, of course, to carbon, to greenhouse gases, but also to biodiversity. And these things are all very, very much interlinked. And of course, I'm, I'm listening and, and we're talking a lot about UK production, uh, but of course, we all like coffee, tea, cocoa, and also things like uh, kidney beans and chickpeas, which are very much crops, which are produced by smallholders in the tropics, particularly for me, I work in Africa. And of course, providing them with a market in Europe is, is, is very essential. It's, uh, we don't want to cut that off. And, and when we start to talk about some of the transitions, a lot of what we're discussing around at the farm level uh, is often sort of we need to reduce inputs. And, where I work in Africa in uh, smallholder farming, it's a bit the opposite, actually. If we want to get sustainable farming, pro providing sustainable livelihoods for people, we actually need to start to increase inputs to allow production to rise. And that actually, if we want to build soil organic matter and store carbon, we also then need to use 
nutrients. So that means adding more fertilizer potentially in some of those systems. So I think we've got to be very careful about uh, saying this is the way to go. And I think the what I've been listening is everybody's very much engaged with that. We need locally tailored solutions, tailored approaches. And we shouldn't be trying to dictate, you should do this, we should do that. Yeah, I mean, it, it needs to be worked out locally. Another point we really have to remember is that, that smallholder producers in many countries in the developing world are often net consumers of food. So simply boosting food prices actually hits their pocket very hard because they're often spending up to 50, 60% of their income on food in addition to the food they produce and the commodities they sell. And we hear a lot these days, and I work with many of the companies, including some of those that we've been discussing with today around this concept of living income. How do we provide a living income for farmers in all of these supply chains? And that's quite difficult because we're actually addressing uh, often situations where poverty is fairly entrenched and where agriculture isn't the only thing we need to address. So I think there's a really big important issue there in engaging with governments, looking at issues beyond agriculture in this broader food system in terms of social protection, et cetera. Uh, so it's not just for people in the food chain, it's also the broader implications. I heard some really interesting stuff today, and I think it's really important about the idea of, of getting better practice in Europe, particularly, of course, in the UK, where you're interested in. But we should also remember that if we're reducing yields or reducing the land area under agriculture, we will have this broader issue elsewhere. We'll be increasing our ecological footprint in other parts of the world. We'll be, as I heard talk, I thought it's a great phrasing, offshoring our emissions or offshoring our negative biodiversity impacts. And we very much need to keep that in sight. And, and work I do with NUNIT WCMC in Cambridge is very much looking at the impacts of trade on, on biodiversity globally and, and what's the role of the smallholder within that. So I think, you know, great to see this activity in the UK, but I do think we need to think beyond that and, and look at these global linkages. And, and yeah, that's absolutely key as we move into this debate about you know, what, what should we do next and, and how can we get started? So thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, contribute. Well, thank you very much for that, Ken. And um, you know, interesting to to challenge the debate about sort of increasing versus reducing as well, um, and given the different elements of, of what's important. So, thank you very much. We now move on to um, questions from the floor. So, all our panelists will will join me up here. So, if we just want to to bring them up. That's brilliant. We're all there. Thank you. Um, now, again, as I said, if you, if you can start posting questions in the Q&A bit of, of the Zoom, then we will pick those up and we will answer as many as we can. Those that we can't, we will answer and, and post on the website. And we'll also post a recording of this on the website as well. So you'll be able to come back and watch bits of it again if you want to. And the same is true for the, the following pieces. But a few questions just to start us off. And first of all, to Sophie. Uh, what do you think are the biggest challenges to addressing the priorities that have been identified for achieving net zero? So you talked about what you're going to do, but what are the biggest challenges, do you think? Well, there, there are probably many and varied, to be fair. I think some of the challenges um, uh, can be described um, down at local level from farmers themselves, just actually, and just, well, what's the right thing to do? How can I get started? When you sort of say net zero, crikey, it's just a big conceptual, you know, sort of idea. How do you break that down into something that's relevant for me and my farm? And actually, how is it going to make a difference to, you know, to my productivity, to my landscape? And where do I find my sort of, um, you know, not only my environment, environmental sustainability but my economic sustainability so I think that sort of picks up some of the things that Adele was talking about before so I think you know there's some real really sort of a, some of those sort of mindset and and supporting questions for farmers that are, are genuinely sort of quite a big challenge and I think some of the 
work that we're doing um, with uh, with obviously we're wider you know groups like RAP and Sustainable Food Trust, but also within our own net zero projects, is to try and help address some of those challenges and put in those support structures for farmers. Um, I think other big challenges and sometimes that can hold people back from wanting to get involved is about, you know, I often hear, well, we just need to wait till we have the right metric before we can do anything. Um, but actually, you know, we, we could be years before we really settle on the actual perfect metric or the perfect path. And so I think another thing that's really important, too, is to, you know, we know the principles in the roadmap of what is going to help us. Um, on farm levels, reduce emissions, and then, you know, with that net zero balance, increase, increase sequestration opportunities. So to be able to start acting and doing something is going to be better than waiting for the perfect metric to present itself. So I think, I think that's another really sort of big challenges. And some of the big challenges too sort of go that go on further back too into sort of there's some of them are real big system changes. So you mentioned before, for example, deforestation. I mean, to be able to, you know, have segregated deforestation free soya, for example, would be um would be a really, really great step forward. However, we know that the, it isn't available yet. Yes, of course. Some of that is available through market demand and by working together and by thinking about how we how we can sort of um, put out those signals. And certainly, you know, we, along with, you know, many others are sort of part of Ethica and the Roundtable for Newer Soy and things like that to understand how we can work together. But but nevertheless, you know, those those are then really big system changes. And some of those things need more than just us to be part of it. So. I think uh, we've talked a little bit, haven't we already, or, or it has been mentioned about that importance of collaboration, but pace. And so I think some of this mindset of how we work together as a, as a group thinking about for the good of the industry, as well as actually, frankly, what's also right for our own customers and our own businesses is a really, really important thing to get right to try and help overcome some of these big system challenges, as well as as well as these sort of more local confidence challenges um, at a farmer level, perhaps. Thank you, thank you. If I could perhaps move to Adele and ask you, um, what have you found so far that helps farmers and growers take action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and that taking action in particular? Yeah, it's, a, it's, um, it's obviously a question that lots of us are asking and deliberating on at the moment, particularly um, I, I've been working in various policy teams in DEFRA, the Welsh Government and now Scottish Government and uh, can, can um, can pass on the message that this is very much live questioning in, in policy rooms at the moment, which is good. Um, I, I think it's a mixture of things. I think it's um, I think firstly it's a it's a clear um, sense of uh, the, the the path ahead for farmers. I think there's a huge amount of confusion at the moment, and I am obviously talking slightly in a UK context, but I think I think it's it is similar in different parts of the world where there's so much talk going on, so many different um, opinions about whether we should be looking at regenerative farming or agroecology or nature friendly farming or climate smart agriculture or sustainable intensification. I could kind of go on with the words. Uh, Really, they're, they're just words. And uh, actually, what we need to be thinking about is how can we improve your soil health? And through that, hopefully, your soil organic matter, carbon sequestration, how can we improve your biodiversity, um, which again will you know, improve, uh, have a knock on climate change benefit impact further down the line? How can we improve your water quality, uh, et cetera, et cetera, your animal welfare? And also your, you know, your productivity, your business case. I think all of all of those things are, are really important, and we need to start giving farmers a really clear direction of travel in terms of where the funding is going to come from, what the public are going to start demanding, and therefore the journey that they need to go on to start making those actions. The second thing, and again, I hate to sound like a broken record, but I do think understanding where you're starting from is a really great. Um, way to start to start thinking about what actions you need to take and i always use the analogy of um the smart meters that we are now um getting installed in all our houses for our electricity when you start to see on the little box on your wall that you're overusing your electricity at some part of the day and actually you could you know, if you turned off your lights you might save this much money uh it's it's the same with you know um kind of greenhouse gas related actions in farming if you if you know where um if you know where you're starting from, you're going to start to understand what actions you need to take. Thank you. I, I think Ken just wanted to jump in on that question. Sure. I, I think you've got a great point there, Adele. And I'm, I, have, I must admit, I haven't looked at your um, your global farm metric, but I will do immediately after this uh, this call. 
Um, I, I fully agree with you. We need to know where we are and where we're heading in terms of direction of travel. One of the things that concerns me a lot is, is though potentially people coming up with ideas that, you know, we have to be measuring soil carbon in every field or something and things which basically won't be possible because for one thing, it's too expensive. It's very difficult to do because of variability. You know, we can put a whole lot of things there, but that shouldn't stop us, of course. And I think that there are some great approaches in terms of, you know, we know what good management practices are. They're often real win-win things. Um, we're talking a lot about carbon, soil carbon, and that's great because we need good soil health, good soil quality, but we won't lock up. I mean, some of us think, unfortunately, on the science side, we shouldn't overplay that one, but we definitely need to stop our nitrogen emissions going rampant as they are. And one of the best ways of actually controlling greenhouse gas emissions is getting more of the nitrogen added into the crop and the products and not being lost into the environment. So I think there are some real win-wins there that really go together. And, and I think this idea of finding, if you like, simple metrics, often metrics based on practice and what farmers are doing in terms of their practice, rather than in terms of trying to measure, okay, you've just got to this point uh, on a scale, are going to be really, really important. So I think that's, that's some a challenge for all of us, but one that, that I think we're we're already, you know, we're not starting from scratch. A lot of the big companies have been doing this for a lot, a, a number of years, for you know, 10, 20 years in terms of under the sustainable agriculture initiative and other things, trying to look at, at ways of measuring and monitoring. So I think, I think we've got some ideas of, uh, of the direction of travel and how to, to move on it. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. If I could move to Nina and say, what do you think is the role of businesses to help farmers and growers change the food system right around the world? Yeah, thank you, Marcus. I mean, certainly McDonald's, you know, we have scale. We're uh, one of the biggest brands globally, but also in the UK, you know, we have 1400 restaurants. We work with over 23,000 British and Irish farmers. So I think we've all said, you know, science research evidence is so important, but how do you then cascade and share that to the, the growers and producers in a way that, um, makes sense in the way that can be adapt with an individual farm business. And I think that bridge is so important in terms of us all work, working together. And of course, you know, at McDonald's, we are not the experts. We haven't got all the solutions. Um, the farmers themselves, you know, they are the experts in terms of good agriculture practice. But it's how we support, where can we support to help to sort of measure, manage, invest in technology, innovation, you know, who knows what will be out there in 10 years time that can really help to accelerate some of this progress and I think where we can play a role as a brand with our scale is to support that you know talking about it sharing best practice uh, we did do a, a beef carbon uh, report a number of years ago over a five-year period we worked with 200 British and Irish farmers and it was just fascinating how those groups came together um, and over that time period we, we could demonstrate for independently that um, carbon emissions were reduced by 23 percent but also there were annual um, average savings of around £23,000, which was fantastic in terms of incentivizing businesses, because ultimately, you know, it has to be economical, profitable for farm businesses, but in a way that we are focusing more on biodiversity, focusing more on nature, on, on soil health, on organic matter content, you know, but that enables good agriculture practice to continue. So I, I would agree with Ken, we're definitely not starting from scratch but it's how we accelerate and, and work together. And we rely on the farmers to, to tell us what they need as well. And then on the other side of the coin, you know, our consumers, they are, their expectation in this, in sustainability and how we can protect the planet is just ever increasing uh, on a daily, weekly basis. Um, so we have to, we have accountability. We, we have a, a duty of care as a brand to, to support that. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and if I come to you, Ken, how do you think we can build momentum within farmers and growers to maintain rapid progress to the sort of hugely challenging net zero sure. goal? I mean, I think we've got to accept we're dealing with a fairly complex problem, yeah? It's, uh, but we shouldn't be frightened, obviously, of starting. I mean, we, we, we talk in, in our sort of policy terms, you've got the carrot, the stick, and the preacher, yeah? And we're doing a lot of preaching. I think we have to avoid being in the situation of, you know, Greta Thunberg talking as, oh, you're, it's all blah, 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 no action. So, I mean, definitely we need the action. 
Um, I think uh, at the policy level, we definitely need in, in the smallholder context globally, but also in Europe to engage with governments. And there's no question about that. You know, it's not all the private sector's responsibility. There's a public role here. There's a role for public governments, uh, you know, the main governments in Africa, but also in, the, in, in Europe. And, you know, I, I get me started on the 0.7% GDP dropping to 0.5% in the UK, which I think is absolutely shameful. Um, you know, in terms of global support, if we're committed, if you like, to, to having a global impact. We have to recognize that if we're talking globally, we've got something in the order of uh, 3 million smallholders, which actually in all their family members comes up towards 3 billion people, almost half the world's population involved in agriculture. So we shouldn't imagine that this is a, there's an easy answer. But very much a, a key point I'd like to make on, on smallholder production is that if we increase prices, that often has a negative effect because they're often net consumers. If we increase productivity, that tends to help the poorest because they've often got the poorest yields that currently, yeah? It, it might seem a bit funny, but actually investing in agricultural productivity for smallholders is really key to rural development. And I, just to, to pick up a couple of things on the, on the chat, people are saying, do you mean using mineral fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers. Well, I'm afraid we do need those as well. I devoted my career to, to, to looking at biological nitrogen fixation through legume crops, through the, the peas and beans and the like, and it's brilliant, but we can't feed the population of the world just on that level of productivity we need. So we need other nutrients, phosphorus, potassium, et cetera. And it, it's really blended approaches, being very efficient with inputs but we do need external inputs if we want outputs from farming. Yeah, uh, it's one of the the hard lessons to learn, I think. Thank you. I mean, yes, I mean, we're all aware of the, the inputs you say, and, and we see those when we look at the carbon footprint, which is is what Karen sort of took us through earlier, mm. that uh, they're all there. And that's part of the, the challenge. Uh, I mean, the other thing that Karen showed was the importance of stopping deforestation. And definitely. Yeah. How do we ensure that that target is delivered? I mean, um, I don't know, perhaps perhaps Sophie and Nina, how, how do you think about that in when you're thinking about your, your procurement and so on and the action you can take? Yes, yeah, certainly. So I don't, I'll kick off if you like. So, um, you know, along with many others, you know, we've set a, a, a target to be um, free from deforestation in our supply chain by 2025. So, you know, that's about sort of setting again, sort of like a target date and then working backwards from that point. Um, but it's also just understanding, well, what does that mean? And, you know, which sort of principles we're working with. So we're thinking about um, the different assurance standards that will help us help get us there. Um, and it's, uh, it's so some of this, some of it is about understanding that, um, yeah, we're sort of looking at RTRS or, you know, Know, various other different schemes that can be used to help you know um, support the farmers and and uh, and landowners in the different areas um, to farm in a sort of a sustainable way and to obviously not farm on sort of deforestation land but it's all deforested or recently like converted land but it's also about understanding the role of technology and we're and some really really interesting sort of pieces of research coming through looking at sort of um, you know how do you guarantee that even if you are sort of buying deforestation free soy it is actually what it says it is so we're sort of keeping really um, uh, sort of um, involved in, in in those sort of pieces of research as well and, and how they're progressing um, but again it's about working with um, others too so you know as much of a, an ambition as we have as Morrisons we're not going to do it on our own you know for things like deforestation it does need us to come together um, and to act with a with a wider and a louder voice by working together and so that's why you know there's there's a, a, a large number of retail and food service institutions who've got the 2025 targets in place um, because uh, again you know we can sort of help stimulate sort of a market call if you like um, but then also, you know, understand what the role of government is with with some of that too, you know, and and where and where um, and where that can 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 help. But certainly too, and, and part of the net zero uh, net zero conversation is to understand about you know products that are coming from deforestation areas to begin with. You know, are there alternatives? You know, so for example, you know, if we're thinking about the role of soya, you know, are there alternatives to soya that we could be using within livestock feed? You know, does it have to be the only um, only source of protein? I mean, it's it's used as a source of protein because it's huge hugely effective powerful protein um and we know and we know why it's a, a popular for livestock feed but you know equally can we challenge this challenge that and look for alternatives so we're reducing our reliance thank on you. the sort of like importing soil thank you and nina is it the same sort of thing for you or 
a different approach. Yeah, I mean, very similar position really to Sophie, as you probably expect, um, you know, within the supply chain. Um, also, you know, set a set a pretty ambitious target, um, similar to, to what Sophie outlined um, by 2026. And I think it is again about that collaboration, also working with our suppliers to really influence, to really work together. Um, and I think it's about, you know, traceability. Again, comes back to being able to measure your baseline, understand, you know, what's in animal feed across different sectors, understanding the, um, the traceability of how, you know, soy is moved around, how the infrastructure within um, the UK and Ireland to support that milestone move that we need to make to be able to reach um, targets such as 2025, 2026. So I think a very similar position. It is a complex challenge, but we, we do have to take action within the UK as a, as a whole. We also sit on the UK Roundtable for Sustainable Soy. Um, it's very important that we continue to not just debate this, but to Ken's point, actually take action and understand what we can actually do collectively um, and then you know, take that forward. And also, you know, on alternative um, proteins, again, comes back to science and research, the importance of being able to not just reduce our soy usage, but actually what other alternatives are out there. And we work with a number of academic institutions across Europe on alternatives within our supply chain, you know, algae being one example. So I think it's, it's great that everyone's coming together, but we do need that clear action plan and then, you know, um, implement it. Thank you. We've got a question about, um carbon markets you know, what are your thoughts on farmers producing income through carbon sequestration you know, do you think that that's a big enough incentive to farmers is there an opportunity there of the carbon markets to to support farmers um anybody got thoughts on that ken i mean i i defer if others want to jump in but you know we we had if i go back 10 15 years ago there were quite some investments in in carbon farming if you like particularly around tree planting schemes and i think they're they're they highly criticised in, in some ways. Um, but that was when the carbon price was, I think it was around $30 a tonne, and it, then it dropped to five. And all of a sudden, all of these initiatives and projects collapsed. And the discussions I've been involved in, I think we're talking about needing a price way above $50 a tonne, maybe towards $100 a tonne, and a stable price over time to really make it work. So I think, yes, it could work. But it need, the incentive needs to be enough and it needs to be stable because if you just uh, get everybody moving down a path and saying, right, you get this much and then say, well, actually, then the price drops and then there's no incentive anymore, then you you blow off all that carbon again. Yeah. So, I mean, it's these are long term investments and it needs long term stable policy, actually. That would be my take on it. I don't know if the others. Thank uh, you. Do you all agree or any, uh, any other views? Yeah, I, I agree with Ken completely about the need for um, stable pricing. I, I know lots of farmers I've spoken to recently are saying we're being approached by X, Y, and Z company, and we don't know in 15 yeah, years sure. if that's still going to be a good deal or not. Yeah. Um, there's also the yeah. possible issue of double funding, which we need to be really aware of. Um, and I think, again, the key thing is having consistent measures and regulations so that um, it's, you know, that everyone is on this on a level playing field but i do i do think if we get it right it could be a really positive you know force for change there's just a lot to get right and it's a bit of a cowboy market at the moment okay thank you um regenerative agriculture has come up quite quite a bit so far in this whole um from from this morning can the panel be clear what what it means how is it different from traditional good agricultural practice and we are, we are nearing the end, actually. So this is a dangerous question to ask, possibly. That, uh, that somebody might say, yes, but I need another hour. But um, can anyone give us a very quick, quick answer on that? Well, I, I did put a, uh, on that question on the uh, answers and questions. I put, I put a, a link to a paper where we tried to explore oh, this. I, I do think it's something that needs, I mean, in, in the end, everybody wants to do better. That's what it's about. It's about trying to, to, to do more than sustainable, Yeah, trying to go one step further, I think. And I think we've got to be a bit careful about making too many claims for what we can do through, you know, for instance, building soil carbon. It's good to do it because it's good for soil fertility, soil health, it's good for crops, it's good potentially for biodiversity. But we have to temper our claims because if, if we try and say, oh, yeah, we can, as, as at one point it was said, we can lock up all the carbon in the world just by improving uh, agricultural practice and that's not true yeah so we've got to temper our claims to be realistic 
when we're going into some of these things. But I think in general, people mean yeah, trying to do it better. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. We are now approaching the end of our session. So a huge thank you to our speakers for such, uh, such an amazing debate and for your insights. Um, we, there were a lot of questions. We haven't been able to get to all of them, but say we, we will try to answer those with the speakers over the next few days and put them on the event website. The recording will also be posted. So if you want to listen to any bit again, you can do. In 10 minutes time, the next session will start and that's going to explore the priorities for the supply chain. And it's got an excellent lineup of speakers from Sodexo, Nestle, Nestle and Wageningen University again. So, um, and it's going to be moderated by Ignacio Haviland from the Consumer Goods Forum. Now, your existing Zoom link will work for that. So you can stay on this, but there'll just be a holding slide for a few minutes while we wait to start. So thank you very much for your time to join the conference, The Hidden Hero, How Can a Net Zero Food System Be Delivered for the Benefit of People and Planet? And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. So thank you to all those for watching and thank you again to the panel. Thank you. Thank you.